at the Guan. Okay. Hello, everybody. This is the Sunday. This is the Sunday meeting I do at Bethany, my daughter. And so now we're back in Texas, and we're going to pick up on our uh, studies. I wanted to just I'll I write everything I just do quick. I did the uh, I made a video at the cathedral church in the front of the church the other day. Because I went downtown, and I like to do some of the videos by the water. Well, sure enough, as I was taking the drive a few days ago, it was downpouring. It was downpour, so I thought, oh, i got to find a dry spot, because obviously I can't walk by the water. So I thought I'll go into the cathedral church, which sometimes I go in and do my prayer time. It's a beautiful, historic cathedral, and uh, if no one's in there, I kind of turn on my video sometimes and teach a little bit because I'm the only one in there. But it was pouring, and I figured, well, let me risk it. I put the phone in my pocket. But the door was sometimes it's locked, so I stood in front of the church and talked. And then I thought, let me visit my friend David Morton because he, he probably knew I was in New Jersey, but because the word gets out, John's back in New Jersey. But I, I ain't seen him in about three weeks, so I figured as soon as I'm done with that, I'll go visit David, and it's in a part of town, uh, cross town and poured and all. And as I'm going down, the streets were flooded, cars were all uh, broken down, you know, stalled out. Yeah. My car drives very low, so I got about a foot, maybe eight inches of water in my car because the floorboard is rusted. And so whenever you go through puddles, so I got a lot of water in the car. I wasn't really upset. I thought, oh, that's fine. I'm doing stuff. And then uh, I realized they had one of the roads was shut, and everyone had to hop over the little underpass. It was kind of illegal, but everybody was doing it, and they were just turning around the other way. And then later on the news, that was the only major flooding, which happened to be in an area that I was coming out. And I thought, but I wasn't upset or anything. And just now, I've been trying to dry the car out, so I drove back to my daughter's house. It's cool. I had the heater on 85, you know, with the windows open to try and dry it out. And But I, all of that, I thought, well, make, make the best opportunity of what you got. And so today, I said, okay, I'll do that. And I, I wanted to talk a little on some of the, I was going to teach Acts chapter 5 because I'm picking up on the study I'm doing at Becky's house, my other daughter. And I accidentally thought I was in Acts chapter 6. So I read that the other night. Acts 6, I'll teach next. Then I realized, no, I still got to do Acts 5. So I read Acts 6, which would have brought me to Acts chapter 7. Okay. So today, part of the sermon at Church Unlimited by the visiting pastor was Acts 7. So I said, okay, maybe I won't teach what I was going to do because it, it kind of progressed that we'll do the little comments I make on the various... Uh, I listened to the Mass this morning. They did Genesis 12. I was going to teach Acts, but I think I'll comment differently today. And I'll make another note that I have a backup laptop computer. And that backup laptop I need to have, because when you begin doing studies, doing teachings, it's, it's a uh, progression. So if you have to spend a whole day getting a new laptop, which happens because my regular laptop seems like it's, I use it a lot, and it seems like it's starting to, I might be time to get me another one just in case. So I pulled out that old backup laptop. And I had a lot of problems with it. The, the keyboard was messed up, but it's a backup, so I plug in a, a, you know, an external keyboard. Oh, that works fine. But every time I open that laptop up, just to get in, I get a little password. Anytime you try to type, because it's an old, uh, it's an old word processor, old word software. And every time I open it up, it would always say uh, it's out of date. So, but it still works if you kind of click through. But for the last few times I messed with it, it just, the keyboard automatically 
starts typing dot, 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 dot. You can't use it. You can barely get in the laptop. So I was at the end of my rope. I said, oh, I already, it's a nice laptop, but the old software word typing software was no good anymore. And now I'm having this. And so this morning I said, I'll uninst uninstall the old word because you can find free word legally, not bootleg. You can get them. But I've never done that before. So sure enough, I did the few little things and I thought it's not going to work, but I'll uninstall it. It took hours to uninstall because it's going slow. I rebooted, I turned it on. And of course, if you can't type, if every time you open up the computer, it automatically, the keyboard is just automatically going, you can't even uh, start. But then when I uninstalled everything and rebooted, and I thought it's not going to work. But then I said, I'll just pray. I kind of wanted to buy another one, but I spent that money on the trip. I said, I'll just pray. Sure enough, I managed to get it, and I downloaded, I think it's called something like Kingsford. It's I just Googled free uh, software like Word, and there's one. It's I downloaded it. I installed it. You always risk installing free stuff. Uh, my antivirus caught it, it said, uh, as it was installing. And, but it was interesting because everything that I needed to get to today, I said, okay, I've got a lot of work to do. I've got a lot of things to do. But if the Lord wants me to uh, keep functioning, doing the teachings and everything, I said, I need you to help. So I prayed, and it worked. And I saved. That laptop's worth about 500 It's a nicer yes. laptop. And then I also thought this morning, I read the book of Kings, the first chapter, last night, I think. And I thought, I had a thought, should I start a whole nother study in the book of Kings? And it just came to my mind, check your own websites. See if you ever taught a commentary on the book of Kings. And you would think, can't you remember that, John? No, if you do a lot of teaching over the years, you don't remember what you taught. And when I was doing radio, I wrote commentaries on the Bible, and then I did radio, and and I, I was going to just let that, I, I said, oh, that's got to be not a thought from God, you know, start a whole new thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then in the midst of everything else I was doing, it came back to me. Just check, it won't take long, John. Just check if you taught a commentary on Kings, and if you did, so I went to my website. Uh, I, there's a, two, a few of them, but I went to... Uh, WordPress, and I just looked. I have the whole commentary already done, already posted online. So I just move it over to another categories I'm doing on the on a folder, and it'll be very easy to do it. So I'll do a whole new study. But I, I shared that to say, once you learn, see, once you get the routine, whether it's reading, scripture, praying, teaching, once you discipline that particular function then you're on a you're on a roll in the sense that you get the discipline in and then it becomes easy to do okay but if you don't put your time into that a lot of the pastor at, we're going to make the comment I'm going to teach in about a second here but the pastor at Church Unlimited the guest pastor from San Antonio he talked about his kids how you can master all of these video games and I had friends at the firehouse that loved every... I used to play the PlayStation 2, and I did like the war games and all. I re-hooked it up about a year ago. I played it one day, and that was it. It's okay to play the video games. But, you know, the kids, once they master those, they master every little technique and all, which if you as an adult had to learn it, it would be hard. But once you learn a certain thing, then they know how to do it. They know... But I, I often thought all the hours that we do spend maybe learning all of the techniques to master a video game and all the hours to, you know, the ones that are mystery and you got to get all the keys and this and that. I said, but if we utilize that for things that are profitable, okay? Utilize the time you have. Learn the routine, whether it's teaching, whether it's uh, like I'm sharing with you, once you learn the routine, once you learn the process, then it becomes natural. But you just have to decide to do that. Um, I like to watch a lot of teaching things on ancient civilizations or whatever. 
at first, when you go through a lot of those courses, I'm taking another, I'm reviewing one of my old courses on, uh, uh, I ordered from the courses online. But once you learn those things, then you develop an appetite for learning. And I'm reading through Proverbs, and it talks about that. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, get understanding. It's better than riches, it's better than treasure. It's, uh, exalt wisdom and, and you will be promoted. Now, if you discipline yourself and say, I'm going to learn, I'm going to be a lifelong student, I'm going to read scripture, and I'm going to get and I'm going to get these habits in place. Once they're in place, then it becomes easy. It's like the kids that play the video games. Then it becomes easy. This morning, I uploaded a video. Today is Sunday. I uploaded one. It's called Big Charlie. My friend Big Charlie, those of you that see this, by the time you see this, you would had already saw the Big Charlie video. But Big Charlie talked for about 30 minutes, and you could see he uh, knows a lot of the Bible. Now, he got a few things wrong, so I debated, but I corrected a few of the important things in the text of the post. But if you'll notice, some of my friends can quote scripture. Andy, who was on the video as well, but he didn't speak. They can quote. They have, they've storehoused enough Bible in them throughout their experiences where they can quote and they can teach. Now, if you'll notice, my friend Charlie on the video called Big Charlie, I tried to have him talk about some of the stuff that he was talking before I turned the video on. And so I said, what about, Charlie, what you were saying about the story of Joseph? Okay, the story of Joseph, which Charlie spoke about, we find in the book of Genesis. All right, in the book of Genesis, we read the famous story of how Joseph was the, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Okay, you had Abraham, you had Isaac, then you had Jacob. And Jacob had what we called the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, out of those 12 sons, eventually that expanded to the entire nation of Israel, which is the progression of the story of the children of Israel in the Old Testament. It begins with the promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. When I listened to the Mass today, having no intention, I was going to teach Acts 5, Sure enough, I'm listening to the Mass at the house on the radio. And one of the verses was Abraham from Genesis 12. Okay, that verse from Genesis 12 is God's promise to Abraham. He says, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless those who bless thee, and I will curse him who, him who curses thee. And through thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That was the verse from the Sunday Mass, a few others. Now that promise that God makes to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 is if you obey me, you leave your familiar surroundings, you go to a new land, you go on this journey, I promise you, Abraham, you're going to have so, such an extended family that it, they're going to be like the stars in heaven for number and the sand by the seashore, okay? In the whole story, which I taught this last year, most of this, but in the story of Abraham, he begins the journey, and he goes to this land where God tells him, I want you to go to, which eventually we refer to as the promised land and the land of Israel. But at the time of Abraham, it was just, he was just a foreigner in that land. He was a stranger, but God made that promise. And as time progressed, we read this from Genesis chapter 12 all the way to Genesis chapter 22. As time progressed, Abraham has no kids, and his wife Sarah is not getting pregnant, and he begins to say, maybe there's another way God's going to fulfill this promise. And then eventually, though, I won't do it all. I've done it all before. Eventually, at the age of 100 for Abraham and the age of 90 for Sarah, she finally has a child. Sarah, his wife, gets pregnant. And that's the fulfillment of the promise. And the name of the son from Sarah, which I've taught before, is Isaac, Abraham's 
promise to God uh, from God to Abraham is now being fulfilled through the promised seed. I taught all of that when I did the teaching of Galatians. But what's interesting is today's verses that came from the Mass. Well, in the visiting pastor in uh, Church Unlimited, he spoke, most of the verses were from uh, Acts chapter 7, which was the one I would have accidentally read, thinking I was up to that next. But in Acts 7 is the history of the nation of Israel given by the first martyr recorded at that point in the book of Acts, because the book of Acts is a history of the early church. And we're going to read about Stephen when you get to Acts 7. Now, I won't do all of Acts 7, but I'll show you how this fits in with why we're kind of doing this little thing today, how each time I do a Sunday meeting with my daughter, I try to just show how all of the different churches actually seem to be, you know, the Spirit of God is speaking through all of them even the one from the Mass, the verse that I read. So in Acts 7, you have the deacon by the name of Stephen. And he was full, full of wisdom and full of understanding. And as Stephen begins preaching about Jesus Christ, it says the people that were trying to argue with him, they were unable to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. So this early believer by the name of Stephen, who becomes this first martyr, in Acts 7, he begins recounting the history of the nation of Israel. And he gets all the way to the point of what I just taught about the promise of God to Abraham. Stephen teaches that. Go read Acts 7. It's good history. It's a long chapter, and it covers the whole history of the Old Testament in that one chapter, and it's the best single chapter that you could read that gives you a brief history of the nation of Israel. So as Stephen's preaching to them, and he t talks about the promise of God to Abraham. Now this is Stephen in the first century in the book of Acts, recounting the story. And then he gets to Joseph, the same story that uh, the pastor spoke on today, and my friend Charlie was preaching on talking about the story of Joseph. And when Stephen gets to the story of Joseph in Acts 7, he says, now look at how the progression of this promise was made to our forefathers, to the patriarchs. God made this promise to Abraham, and eventually Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, Jacob has the tribes. But the story of Joseph and his father, Jacob, is really what we find focused on at the end of the book of Genesis, we see the interesting story of Joseph more than any of the other sons, okay? Because what happens in the case of Joseph, he's a type and a symbol of Jesus himself. This is why Stephen in Acts 7 begins focusing on the story of Joseph. Because in the early church and in these chapters I'm teaching, what you find is the early Jewish believers the apostles and the early disciples, trying to tell their fellow brother Jews, look, Jesus is the Messiah. And it, he was written about in the entire story of our Old Testament Bibles over and over again. Look at this, look at this sign, look at this symbol. And that's where you find the apostle Paul, who's not converted yet at the point of Acts 7, Paul's conversion is Acts 9. But that's where you find these early Jewish apostles and teachers so excited because for many hundreds and hundreds of years, they're reading the stories of the prophets, they're reading the Old Testament, and then when the time of Christ came, finally their eyes have been opened and they're realizing this Jesus is in the whole history of our Old Testament prophets. Now, Stephen teaches the story of Joseph. I didn't have time to comment on some of the significant points about the story of Joseph. But if you read my commentary on Genesis, I kind of hit on them there, but I'll do it brief. When Joseph is born, the pastor at Church Unlimited mentioned this today, Joseph's father, Jacob, begins favoring him above the other brothers. 
he gives him the coat of many colors, which the pastor mentioned today, the visiting pastor. And it was a special coat. But he gives it to Joseph, which is really his kind of like favorite son. And the other brothers rightfully are like a little, you know, hey, wait a minute. You know, dad came back from New Jersey and he gave, you know, Bethany a thousand dollar gift and nobody else got anything else. Well, that's kind of how the other brothers started feeling when his father, Jacob, favored him. Well, the brothers are starting to get jealous. And in the story of Joseph, in the book of Genesis, Joseph also has these dreams. And when Joseph has these dreams, the interpretation of the dreams is someday, and he tells these dreams to his brothers and to his father, but the interpretation of the dreams is, guess what? Guess what God showed me in these dreams? What did he show you, Brother Joseph? Oh, you're all going to bow down to me and you're all going to serve me. What? You already are getting favored by our father. Now you're running around telling us about these dreams that we are all going to serve you someday. So the brothers were pretty getting fed up with Joseph at that point of the story. Now this is the story also that Stephen is telling in the book of Acts. But this is found in Genesis. So eventually the brothers betray their brother. And they sell him as a slave into Egypt, okay? But the brothers make it look like he died. They, they kind of took his, oh, that wonderful coat and all, and they put blood on it, and they brought it back to their father Jacob and said, oh, our brother, look, he's dead. And, and Jacob's like, oh, no, I can't believe it. I lost my son. And, but he was sold as a slave. And when Joseph goes into Egypt as a slave, he seems to be getting blessed in every way, God's favor is on Joseph. And eventually, my friend Charlie taught this on the video I posted today. He kind of got into it a little bit when you heard him speak. But Joseph starts getting favored. And he says, oh, this is, you know, you seem to be doing good. And he works, he's sort of like the accountant or and some, something like that for the man by the name of Potiphar. And Potiphar is an Egyptian and He's like, wow, this Joseph guy, you know, this is the best slave purchase I ever made. You know, this guy is really good. He's like a CEO. And Joseph's starting to do real good. Now, you might think, how is this story important? And if I remember, I'll, I'll, get to, I'll get to why it's so important. Why Stephen in the New Testament brings this up. I think sometimes we don't, when I teach Acts 7, which I'm not really doing right now on this video, but you'll see why Stephen brings this up. It becomes so significant in the story of the people of God and how they were going to respond to the appearing of Jesus in the first century. It was prophesied that they would reject Christ. Okay? That's why Stephen brings the story up. I'll tell some more of the story of Joseph. Well, Joseph is so successful that you know, the Potiphar says, look, you know, you're in charge of everything here. Now, guess what? Potiphar has a wife, and the wife has a crush on Joseph. And it says day after day, this is in the book of Genesis, it says day after day, she said, let's fool around. When, when Potiphar, my husband, is gone, let's fool around, because he's taking care of the house. And he says, no, no. So one day it says she grabbed hold of his cloak and he fled the house naked, and she kept the coat behind. Well, now she's mad because she's scorned, and she says, Oh, look, this man that Potiphar brought in, this man Joseph, he tried to rape me, which was a lie. Well, he gets framed for the rape. They throw him in a jail. So Joseph already got sold as a slave into Egypt by his brothers. And while he was in Egypt as a slave, he began excelling, thinking, oh, okay, maybe I'll just be a good businessman in Egypt. Somehow the dreams will come true that I'll be successful. Nope, now he gets framed for rape. Okay, he's in jail. He's spending time in jail. And once again, the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that even in the jail, 
like, oh, th he's like the best trustee you could ever have. I've had friends in jail. So he's like, oh, he's doing good in the prison too. But over time, Pharaoh, I wasn't going to teach all this, but Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he has a dispute with what we the, the cup holder, the guy who would taste the wine for the king, and the baker. Now, the significance, I didn't get a chance to say this on the other video, but I've taught it before. The significance to these two men, by the way, okay, most of us are familiar that these two men, the cup bearer and the baker of Pharaoh, at the time of Joseph, they get thrown into prison. The king Pharaoh was mad with his own men, and they throw him into prison. Now, when they were in prison with Joseph, they had these dreams. And when they wake up with these dreams, Joseph is an interpreter of dreams. And in the interpretation of the dreams, now I'm going to remember from memory, but in they're both going to have three days of significance. In three days, one of them's going to be released, and in three days, one of them's going to be killed. The significance is this. We see a type of Christ and the cross there because the wine always represents the blood of Jesus in the New Covenant and the bread. So what you find even in these two cupbearer and baker that are thrown into jail, you see a type of Christ there because you're going to have three days. Jesus was buried for three days. You're going to have death. One of them dies. And you're going to have life. One of them has uh, life. So you see the bread, the wine, the death, and the resurrection. All in that symbol of the dreams that these men have. But Joseph interprets their dreams. This is what's significant about the story of Joseph. And then he says, after he interprets the dreams, he says, but don't forget to tell Pharaoh. Don't forget to tell the king. I've got framed and I'm sitting in here all these years. Don't forget to tell him but they do forget to tell him. But later on in the story, Pharaoh does himself have dreams, and he needs the interpretation of the dreams. Now, Pharaoh's dreams, this is all the book of Genesis now, the last ending of Genesis. Pharaoh's dreams disturb him, and he's thinking, I need somebody to interpret my dreams. And then the one person who survived, that was the servant of Pharaoh, he... One day, uh, Joseph said, you're going to survive. The other one's going to get killed. The one that survived and went back to work for the king, work for Pharaoh, he then remembers and he says to Pharaoh, oh, I forgot. Remember when you threw us in prison? Well, there was a guy in there by the name of Joseph. And he told me to mention him to you. You know, he's been framed for all those years for the rape of Potiphar's wife. But I forgot. But he can interpret the dream. Okay, go get him. So he gets Joseph. The interpretation of the dreams, I won't do it all. But interpret, there's going to be a famine in the land. That's going to be the interpretation of the dreams. It's going to be seven years of famine. And what you should do, Pharaoh Joseph is interpreting these dreams for Pharaoh. What you should do is do a storehouse and save up for the seven good years. Because when the seven bad years of famine comes, all the surrounding territories are going to come to us into Egypt. And they're going to want food. Because we're going to be the only ones with food. So... Good. And you know what, Joseph? You did such a good job interpreting dreams. I'm going to put you in charge of it all. Well, Joseph becomes in charge of everything. Oh, this is great. And over time, they had the seven years of plenty, but then they're going to have the seven years of famine. And guess who shows up in the land of Egypt to start getting food? Those brothers that he dreamed that someday you're going to come bow down to me they start showing up to Joseph oh, after all that happened. But it says they don't recognize Joseph, but he recognizes them. He was already speaking the Egyptian accent and language and all, but he knows what his brothers are saying when they're coming. He recognizes, but they don't recognize Joseph, which is a type of Christ. In the first, this is the significance now. In the first century, Stephen is now telling them in Acts 7. Don't you remember? God ordained Joseph 
and made Joseph to be the one that would save his brothers, but they didn't recognize him. And now Stephen's beginning to use this. This is the significance. He's saying Christ is indeed the Messiah, but you are not recognizing him as the Messiah. Just like the brothers of Joseph did not recognize their own brother as the deliverer that would deliver. And Stephen brings this up. Also the story of Moses Stephen's going to bring up. But I'll finish a little bit on the story of Joseph. So eventually there's a lot of little conniving that goes on. But eventually Joseph wants to see his father. And so they do like a little scheme. And the one younger brother that they never, they're going back and forth to Egypt. Jacob and his sons, thinking Joseph's dead all this time. Jacob thought my son Joseph's dead. They, he still doesn't know his son Joseph is actually alive. But it, the sons start going back like all the other territories around Egypt because Joseph interpreted the dream for Pharaoh and it's coming to pass. And as they're coming back and forth, Joseph does some little tricks because he wants to get the rest of his family back. He wants the father to come back and all. So Joseph does some tricks, those who have read this story. And eventually, at one meeting, the brothers are all there. And Joseph says to them, he, he breaks down and cries because they're all talking to themselves about, oh, we betrayed our brother Joseph, and this is why all this is happening to us. And they don't know he's right there listening. So at the end, let's see how long we go. At the end of that story, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers and says, I'm Joseph, and they're shocked. He says, I'm, the, I'm your own brother, and I'm the one that was sent forth to save you in the end. And so Stephen, and the significance of that, he's telling his fellow Jews at the time of Christ, look, you, Israel, just like the brothers, you didn't recognize him, that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the deliverer. He's the fulfillment. But now you need to recognize him because he's the only one that can sustain life. You can only get eternal life. That's really the significance of the story of Joseph. Eventually, Jacob, the father, after he was so distraught because he eventually, some of the things happen, he finds out that his son Joseph was alive and the dreams were fulfilled and it was that's the, really the whole significance of that. And how does that fit with the verse from Mass? Well, that's the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. I'm going to make your children your offspring. They're going to be like the stars of heaven and the sand by the seashore. That happens while they're in Egypt because Joseph goes down and his family. They eventually go from a small group, 70-something people, to thousands and thousands and thousands. And eventually, another pharaoh realizes we got to do something about these Israelites. Sort of like the whole illegal immigration thing that we go through in this country. And pharaoh says, we're going to have to start doing something to stop uh, these Jews from, you know, populating Egypt here because they're going to get stronger than us. And eventually... There becomes an oppression. They go after the kids. And then God raises up later Moses. Moses becomes the deliverer of these huge family that, that are in Egypt. And Moses, what does he do? The great story of Moses we read about in the book of Exodus. He confronts Pharaoh. Eventually they're delivered out of the, this is a lot of Old Testament history. God delivers them through the great Passover. And they wind up at a place called the Promised Land. Oh, this is the promise. Not only was Abraham going to have all these kids, but you're going to inherit this Promised Land where Abraham is living. That's the land of Canaan. We read about that in the book of Joshua. But when they get into the Promised Land, they send some spies in. They say that this is the deliverance of the people of God out of Egypt by Moses, who was also a type of Christ which Stephen teaches that in Acts chapter 7. The same type of thing, because Moses was called to be a deliverer again for the Jewish people. Moses himself, out of his own mouth in the Old Testament, says, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like unto me, 
And everyone that does not hear that prophet is going to be destroyed from among the people. The Apostle Peter quotes that from the lips of Moses in the book of Acts, just like Stephen's using the story of Moses, and says Jesus is that prophet. Jesus was the prophet that Moses himself prophesied about. Well, that's the deliverer. Moses delivered him. Then we, when they get to the promised land, they send the spies in. And when they go spy out the land, they're ready to take it. This is the fulfillment of the promise. But 10 of them say, oh, it's a great land. It's a beautiful land. But we'll never take it. The inhabitants in that land, they're like giants. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. We'll never take it. But there were two spies, <clears throat> Joshua and Caleb. And those two said, no. No, let's take the land right now. This is the promise. God opened up the Red Sea. Look at Moses did all this for us. How can we not believe God now? But they didn't believe. They instilled fear on the hearts of the people. So they did not possess the promised land. And they wasted 40 years in the wilderness. They could have had that land in a few days. But for the whole 40 years in the wilderness, because they did not believe. The two Spies, Joshua and Caleb, brought back the good report, but the other ten said, oh, it's a great land, the milk and honey and all, but we can't do it. So they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now, the writer of Hebrews, I'm going to teach a little bit because I'm getting this far. The writer of Hebrews takes this story in the New Testament and says they could not enter in because of the unbelief. So likewise, first century Jewish person, if you do not believe the gospel, you too cannot inherit. Because the writer of Hebrews, who I think was the Apostle Paul, he says all of that was just symbols. The true promised land is the new covenant. Believe in Jesus, the name Joshua in the Old Testament, Jesus in the New Testament are synonymous. He says the true deliverer, of the true Jesus, the Lord, you've got to believe the promise and then you'll be saved. That's the whole significance of that story of the promised land. But if afterward, they do enter into the promised land, but God made them stay as judgment for their unbelief. And the significance of that was those who do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah also cannot, quote, enter the promised land. Now, the writer of Hebrews actually says these promises weren't really about that old promised land. Because later on, David in the book of Psalms will continue to say there's still a rest for the people of God. So if David, who comes later in the history, who I'll be teaching in the book of Kings, if he's prophesying that there's still a time of rest after the promised land was taken, therefore this hope must have been about something else, not about some territory in the Middle East. And the writer of Hebrews does indeed tell us it's about the inheritance of eternal life through Jesus. That's what all that was about. Joseph, Moses, David, it was all leading to the time of Christ. And that's why in Acts 7, which we kind of got into today, and Genesis 12, the promise, and the whole story, all of it is now fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We enter into rest, which was grace. That was the rest. But you got to believe to enter into it. And the first generation that was going to go into that old promised land, they could not enter in because of unbelief. Therefore, Stephen and the writer Hebrews is saying, you must believe in the gospel. You can only be justified by faith, not by the works of the law. And so all of this is very consistent. A lot of people say the Bible's full of contradictions. Look, all of this was written over many thousands of years, and how you could have all planned all of this out and this is historical reality, it was God's, God's divine conspiracy is what it was. I'll, solve, I'll title it that. Now, I know I covered a lot. Let's see, 40 minutes. I was going to do Acts 5, but I didn't do it because of the way the mass verse was Genesis 12. The Acts 7 was from Church Unlimited. Charlie himself on the video I posted. So today it fit more like that. That's a lot of history to cover. But in short, all of those men uh, that we read about, the Moses and the Josephs, and these are all symbols, types, and they all point to Christ. 
They all point to Jesus. And the apostles and teachers in the New Testament, that's how they take these stories. When I do Acts 5, which in a few days I'll cover it, it says they kept preaching that one of the things that I didn't cover, but in Acts 5, they throw Peter in jail. They say, stop preaching. And an angel goes into the jail, releases Peter, and he gives him this message. It says, go, to the, go into the temple and preach about the words of this life. And it says they kept preaching about Jesus. So the message, the gospel, was Jesus Christ. And all of the stories of the Old Testament, as interesting as they are, they were for the singular purpose of pointing everybody to Jesus, the Messiah, the only way to the Father. Okay, so I covered a lot today. Bethany, do you have any questions? Good. Uh, yes, bring something up. Church. Well, I guess like with the Jewish belief that, that so Jews believe in the Old Testament, but they yes. don't necessarily believe in the, that Jesus was the Messiah, Correct. some of them. Correct. Does that mean there wouldn't go? Well, Maybe this, this would be a long thing, um, but Paul in the book of Romans says, God made a promise that all Israel will be saved. Now, Bible scholars question, well, what does Paul mean in the letter of Romans? God promises that at the return of Jesus, it says, every eye will see him. It says, and they also which pierced him shall look upon him. These are promises in the book of Zechariah and in the Old Testament. So Paul seems to be saying that at the second coming of Christ, the physical return of Jesus, that all Israel, all the Jews who do not believe, he says at that moment they will look mm -hmm. upon him whom they have pierced, and there will be poured out a spirit of repentance. Okay. So now when I taught these verses and chapters in the book of Romans, which is chapter 9, chapter 10 and 11 in there, these scholarly people have looked at those chapters and disagreed on But I think the plain reading is God's promised that they will be saved, but it will never happen apart from believing in Jesus. Yeah. But at the return, they will be able to believe because they'll look upon him, it says, that's a prophecy from Zechariah, I believe, they'll look upon him whom they have pierced. So in the in the progression of all of this, God's still got a lot of work to do. It says a nation will be born in a day. That's a prophecy that at that moment, at the return of Christ. It's, and Paul would say, if the rejection of Jesus by his Jewish brothers was the bringing in of all the other people to believe, how much more when they come into Christ, it will be at the fulfillment, culmination of everything. So we do have scriptures that talk about our Jewish brothers and sisters eventually one day believing. And there's what we refer to as a remnant today, meaning there are Messianic congregations. Mm -hmm. There are Jewish people today who have been accepting Jesus as Messiah. Mm -hmm. They don't consider themselves, quote, fully converting to Christianity in the sense of all of the development of Christianity, but they are indeed believers because they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So that's an interesting thing, the way that works. But yes, someday we do believe that's the promise that the Jewish people are coming. All right, I think we'll end with that. Because okay. we did. And Anthony, my son-in-law, is coming back in. He just went to get tacos for him and my daughter. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you for letting us cover a lot of that today. I pray that you would help people to, uh, when they read all the... I'll add the little teachings along with this video. I pray you'd help them to learn. We ask a blessing on everyone. In Jesus' name, amen.